we met several times at various EDGE conferences since uh, EDGE was uh, uh, still being uh, uh, still controversial and still being defined. And, uh, you know, Mark uh, uh, earlier at er Ericsson and now on his own. So, uh, so I'm kind of, uh, I saw this on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, I'm aware of, uh, you know, what Walter was doing earlier and how they pivoted. So I thought it would be a good uh, idea to kind of uh, see where the world is headed uh, now because uh, I've, uh, after my old blog uh, with uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, uh, Joseph uh, on the state of the edge, uh, you know, the edge has kind of uh, taken different flavors, some moving faster, some slower. Uh, 5G isn't happening as fast as it was supposed to happen. Uh, obviously, the uh, China geopolitics throws everything uh, uh, in a different situation, um, in a different direction, right? At least from Sanders and other, uh, and you know, Etsy, Mac, or whatever else. So I thought it'll be, uh, it's always good to, uh, you know, hear uh, some of the folks who are uh, little, uh, who have a little less filter and are not bothered about uh, too much about the spiel or conference talk and uh, hear what they're saying uh, and feeling about it. Uh-oh, Rob, we can't hear you. Can't hear uh, you. Yeah. Sorry, that was me, I was muting myself. Yeah, no, do you have a position on, you know, why, I, you know, those are all important topics. I, I, you wanna start with 5G? Because I, 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 I go back and forth, right? Everybody seems to think 5G is the, the answer, um, I'm not sure what the question is <laughs> in that case, but um, you do. You yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, uh, I think 5G is kind of like, it's a bet everyone is making, uh, is, is my personal view. There will be something good that will happen because when the network slicing comes in, that's where the money comes in. Beyond network slicing, I, I mean, I do see value. I just don't see the economics, right? It's classical CFO versus a product guy fight. So. so can I ask, um, Rob, is it okay if I ask Vishal a question? Yeah, please. No, it's just, this is open. Oh, so okay. I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm free for all sort of. <laughs> Until it gets okay. out of control. Well, so back, to, like, so I'm like thinking of, hey, Mark, um, I wonder, and maybe Mark can answer too. I'm from a security perspective, I hear conflicting things. I hear that 5G is going to be more secure because uh, the telecom providers are going to build security natively into the 5G environment. Um, and then I hear other people say, no, 5G is going to be less secure because just just by its mere architecture and how it's set up. So I'm confused based upon what I'm reading. Does anybody have any thoughts there? Uh, I wish I could provide a better answer, Joe, but um, I, I wouldn't uh, want to classify my understanding of 5G from a security standpoint as anything above, uh, you know, just barely above layman. Uh, my understanding from a from a traffic control and isolation standpoint, there are some significant security benefits over typical shared traffic on an IP network, right? Mm -hmm. That's that much I understand. What I don't know though is how much of um, the, I, the 5G device itself can be spoofed or uh, broken into for um, traffic use or visibility to unprotected traffic. But if you, for instance, if you create a slice and you prioritize traffic, you have a really good ability to provide security for that slice of traffic over what you would normally get like uh, doing a traditional um, IP link or VPN link between two people. But with limited availability of 5G and with all the connect connectivity options today for Edge, what is the likelihood that you're going to have enough devices that are going to be 5G enabled as opposed to some other form of connectivity enabled. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak for the entire um, group of folks on the panel here, but um, the, you know, as, as many people have said, the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. And uh, <laughs> 5G is, um, is uh, definitely represents that. Uh, I think 
the um, example of edge development is that people have already determined that there is an enormous demand and opportunity at the edge. And so they're fulfilling opportunities at the edge with or without 5G. 5G, yeah. once it becomes more and more available, will just become a de facto standard for um, allowing for greater use of more and greater use of, of high performance, high reliability connectivity. Because we talked about security a little bit already relative to slicing, but the most important part about, in my mind, beyond um, lower latency in the connection, right? When that's the key, right? The difference between LTE and 5G, LTE and wireless and, and or 5G and wireless is, is, isn't just that um, it somehow magically changes um, performance from one destination to another, but it's in the translation of accepting the packet and sending it somewhere else where even really good 4G is 20 to 40 milliseconds or LTE and, and 5G can be one to three milliseconds and less, right? And so um, that being said, the, it's the dependability of the circuit and the connection that is so critical to many of the services that are likely to benefit from 5G as it becomes more pervasive. Things like telesurgery as a great example, right? Um, uh, things where uh, if you're platooning vehicles and not platooning in the sense like I've got 10 FedEx trucks that are following each other and only one of them has a driver, but like I'm actually attempting to uh, mass control cars from different drivers in different parts of the city all at the same time and effectively nullify the need for streetlights. Those kinds of environments mean not just low latency, high security and a guaranteed performance capability of that network at all times. So I don't know if I answered the question entirely, but uh, 5G is not going to be here overnight. Um, mm -hmm. What I have seen though is that I've talked to some of the large providers of 5G and um, because I'm interested in doing some POCs on in just what I happen to be working on personally mm -hmm. with my company. And while they all love the idea of the POC, and, and I, I trust that they do because I know these, so I don't think they're blowing up my, uh, my pants. Um, and, but they all say, Mark, I, I would love to do this, but we just do not have the resource right now. We are putting everything we have, everything we have in rolling out the, for the demand we have already. So all wow. the indicators I have are that these people are putting out 5G as fast or faster than they had hoped for, um, and that the demand for it is actually there. So it's 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 a to me it's a it's a surprise in a good way. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, uh, going back to Joe's uh, original question, right? I mean, I, I agree, Mark. I mean, I think from your edge gravity and other uh, experiences, right? Uh, the, the network slicing is going to be such a small part part of the market, right? Overall, 5G market and what flavors and what uh, frequency bands and how much spectrum you have globally available. And 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 I say it mostly from the point of view. My early days at Qualcomm, and we were doing App Store in 2003, 2004, before the original App Stores came in 2008 and 9. Uh, you know, before a thing becomes global, it takes long time and Security, Joe, is really, you know, kind of state of mind in this uh, 5G world, right? I mean, do you, would you feel more secure, uh, you know, out somewhere in Rio or somewhere more secure in San Diego and California, right? So I think it depends what the architectures are implemented by these guys and how it kind of rolls out. I think that's how uh, you're going to see, but they're not practically there are no standards, right? So you want to see uh, typically that I see in China and mostly the developed world, you know, I go to Chinese customer, if my product is 80% ready, they're willing to go ahead and do anything else. And uh, if I go to a Google or a Facebook, they want like product to be 120% complete mm -hmm. before they want to touch and deploy. So it depends where you see what's happening, et cetera, or not. And uh, obviously the flavors and 5G are gonna be very different. Everyone is gonna misuse the term 5G for many years to come, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, including, uh, uh, you know, anyone. I mean, I saw last night something uh, uh, now, uh, Geo claiming they have their own 5G uh, homegrown scratch up and I totally trust and believe them because they have the capability to do uh, with all the ecosystem they're developing. But uh, 
it is still uh, it is still the 5G or the LTE standard that we use to globally today. Uh, we are uh, quite a distance from there, but I totally agree with what uh, Mark said earlier and Rob said earlier. I think Edge will won't have to wait till 5G comes. Flavors and variations of it will be available in different markets in different ways. It it all depends on use case and how the dollars flow, basically. Uh, you, and you said something else super important, which was what I heard you say was adoption's going to happen quick, more quickly in places where they're willing to maybe close a blind eye, turn a blind eye to uh, everything being perfect. Uh, that's how it has happened uh, for, for the longest time. Uh, you know, uh, 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 I'm not at Qualcomm anymore, but when I used to sell Qualcomm handsets in the late 90s, which was a joint venture with Sony, uh, you know, uh, LG was merger of Lucky and Gold Star, two television companies. And, uh, uh, and Samsung was, uh, you know, uh, the modern day Huawei or ZTE uh, uh, from a quality perspective. And Motorola was the benchmark and uh, Nokia eventually caught up. Uh, so things change all the time. Uh, you know, if, if I ask my uh, teenager son on what brand he wants, it's Apple or Samsung. I don't think anyone in 1990s would want to be seen with a Samsung or LG phone. So, uh, uh, a lot of brands are gone. So it's, it's just a perception that changes uh, every uh, 10 to 15 years. And, uh, uh, you know, similarly, uh, data centers, right, certainly when I started doing the arm server chip at Qualcomm, it's like, oh, data centers became, you know, cool and nice things. And, you know, when I first saw a data center in Prenwell at Facebook, uh, when, when uh, their Parekh took us over there, it was like, oh, wow, what's this? So uh, I hadn't seen so many servers in my life in one place. But, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, I think things change, but it's also the scale and the, uh, the scale that you see uh, in in, in uh, non-developed markets and how some of the uh, some of the bigger companies or the governments with national policies are pushing things towards, uh, I think that's where uh, the edge is going to. You're going to see some standards uh, just develop just for the need of it, uh, like the mobile money in, uh, through SMS in Africa, for example. There's no standard set, but it happened 10 years before anything else happened in the developed world. So, so I'll stop there, but uh, I know a few more of the people have joined, but uh, uh, just to kind of, uh, uh, start with some thoughts over there. I, I mean, I can, I can jump in, because one of the things that when we talk about the 5G infrastructure pieces, and maybe maybe this is a divergence, so forgive me if I'm. Do you, does somebody want to come in on the the topics we just discussed? I was going to take five G a little bit different, but a little bit different because I'm always interested in the the shared infrastructure side of it after the VRAN pieces. Hey Rob, um, the, uh, this is Ankur, by the way. I yeah, don't go know ahead. Why. It, it seems like there's many Ankurs on the panel. I don't know what's going on, but creating I, that. I, I, th um, I think we're, I think I'm going to keep watching it, but I think, I think we've got it under control. If, if you are want to talk um, and you're <laughs> make sure that you have a, a legitimate name um, in the chat and, and that'll allow me to identify people, but I, I will, I will not have it. it somebody just got your link or your account. So you might want to change passwords on it just to be careful. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So I ahead. think one of the key, so one of the key things that I want to bring to table is that why is 5G even critical to get edge going? Uh, because there's two aspects to edge. One is the enterprise edge or the nomadic edge, I call it, there's two kinds. And uh, that's something that's on premise. And the second part is what's in the network. And if you didn't look at you know, the local zones and the network zones that AWS is building, they're really talking about you know, 30, 40, between 20 to 50 milliseconds within the metro region, right? And I think that it's unclear if there's any application that exists today that needs that level of interactivity urgently to, to basically get off the ground. Now, 
telemedicine, I, I think, is still far away, and or rather telesurgery or something, that's still far away. And it's it's unclear to me that anybody would rely on 5G for that anyways. It'll probably be all on wired networks. And then the second part is that in the enterprise locations, most of our customers that I've been working with, manufacturing and, and those kind, already have wired connections. They don't really care about 5G other than for CBRS or local 5G kind of use case, right? So I think we need to be cognizant of macro 5G versus local 5G and make sure that we understand the different use cases. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Ankur. I think uh, just for to, to give the background before you join the discussion, uh, the discussion, uh, the point I was making was, uh, you know, as I started talking to uh, Mark and Rob and others uh, over here about three years on different conferences related to edge, uh, uh, people were talking a lot about 5G and I was making a point that uh, 5G may come the last and the edge may happen elsewhere faster or earlier or uh, address different use cases. Uh, the strongest point for 5G edge would be network slicing, uh, where their dollars and security and everything else is kind of figured it out, which will happen at a much later date. It won't happen initially. Right now, the the world that you're referring to where the wires are available all the time is mostly developed world. And uh, out there, yeah, those things work very well. But I think uh, in uh, in large part of Asia or emerging uh, developing emerging markets, uh, I think the wired piece is missing, and hopefully LTE slash 5G versions will figure out something. But that ain't happening anytime soon. It's it's much later in the game. Yes, so I I'd, I'd like to um, add a little bit to that. I think um, uh, I don't I don't want to say that the um, examples provided were were um, simplified uh, edge considerations, um, but I will maybe suggest that I'm still not sure uh, I like including uh, an example that might be fulfilled by an outpost on premises for someone as an edge device. That's just on premises uh, IT that happens to be um, an extension of the public service that you're already using uh, and is on your premises. It's not at this point what I would consider to be edge. Right, um, and and generally speaking, uh, outposts aren't put on people's locations um, as much for latency as they are for security and compliance and and stuff like that. But latency does drive um, the importance of outposts for some because they want to keep their data on site, and having the compute nearby makes sense. So there, you know, it's it's a mix. But generally speaking, just me personally, it doesn't mean that that's what it should be. Me personally, I don't think of that as edge. And so when I do think of edge, I think of places that traditionally have not been supported effectively by network in general, whether that's network in capacity, as in I can get a 10 gig link anytime I want it, uh, or network in distribution, as in I'm at a refinery and there is no network on my facility unless I'm in the office where the Wi-Fi is. Those places and large manufacturing facilities are actually ideal candidates for 5G and many places are already investigating and or implementing. I have several friends that are actively looking, uh, CIOs that are actively looking at using 5G in factories for um, sub three millisecond uh, latency uh, on premises. Um, I've heard the complaint as well about uh, 20 to 40 milliseconds, no applications. There are actually tens of millions of applications that could perform better if they were under 20 milliseconds. And there are many applications available today that would be more useful and sold more effectively if they could be delivered to people in under seven milliseconds. And I do believe that um, once 5G becomes available and some people start using it for services and somebody figures out how to leverage it to gain an advantage over a competitor, it will create a landslide effect, bringing more people to the frontier that we are calling edge. So I actually am more optimistic about solving the problems for 5G, um, or even if we haven't solved all of them, pushing forward with them, because I think the demand will drive it. When somebody sees somebody with a faster car, they're gonna want a faster car. And if your application is responding in, in 20 milliseconds, which oftentimes means that for even a simple application that's a 200 millisecond response time uh, for handshakes, et cetera, and somebody else does it in 80 milliseconds, 
then they're going to win. And that's perception. And that's, and that's the reality of application use. And in many cases, and I, you don't have to take my word for it, you can look at studies done by any number of companies, Google being one of the best, uh, of how saving as much as just a few hundred milliseconds on a transaction um, make a, or, or less make a huge difference on how many people stay on page, uh, don't hit refresh. Um, and you, you talk to somebody at SAP or Oracle, they've all done studies demonstrating how better performance of app for customer, or admittedly they have a biased opinion maybe, but other people outside of them have done, them, done those studies with their apps as well and show that productivity improvements gain tremendously with the uh, updated in performance, not to mention more satisfied customers. So I, I think one of the things that we as a, as a collective we, a royal we of IT tend to forget is that it doesn't matter what we think works today. What matters is what can work and how somebody can benefit from it. And that's been proven throughout history. We had perfectly good phones in 1997. <laughs> We had perfectly good phones in 1997, and yet they are an, an anachronism as compared to what an iPhone was in 2006. And an iPhone in 2006 looks like a piece of junk compared to an iPhone 10. And, and um, many people would argue that what's in my iPhone 10 is you know, this huge computer and it's only getting better, so why would we build stuff at the edge? The bigger the phone gets in capability, the more we're gonna put at the edge because we're gonna to wanna to do even more with the device. And that's been historically true with everything, PCs, handheld phones, laptops. Well, well, what, what, I don't understand, what I don't understand is every time we have an edge conversation somehow, and it, probably it's good or bad, I don't, I don't really care, right? People end up talking about 5G. And I actually think that that is something that kind of bothers me, right? I, I think 5G or not, edge or not, those are really two topics they do have benefits to each other, or both of them could benefit from each other. Each other. But I don't think that they're, they're actually in the same vein, or they are. No. Yeah, totally. Anchor, that's something that I don't understand. Anchor, Anchor, totally agree with you. I mean, and we started out with that part of the conversation, and, and maybe I went a little bit off the charts on 5G there, but um, I mean, that's how uh, uh, I thought I'd already placed that position in the early part of the conversation, that um, I don't believe that uh, Edge is waiting exclusively for 5G. I just think that 5G is a natural inhabitant at the edge and will expand its growth over time. But there are an immense number of opportunities that will be and are being made available via edge right now that have nothing to do with 5G. There's, there's a piece of this that I think is worth talking about that we, we sort of dance over and this is where the, the, the telcos seem like they have an opportunity but then don't seem to know how to execute on it which is lateral communications. Because right, your phone is great as a central hub or the, the screen you're interacting with, but it's not the cent, you know, it's not interacting with the other environmentals in your house. It's not pulling, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of other control systems that we're starting to expose. So your phone becomes the interface point. It's not clear that it is the control point. So if I'm going to aggregate data across all of the devices that I'm putting in a house or an office building or a stadium or a hospital or a city, I need control points, right? Today, we've, we've done them all pretty much as single unit gateways, which is not a very cloud-like solution. It's not distributed scale. It, and, and we end up like each vendor who comes in puts a control box in and then they attach their stuff to the control box and then they send their data out to the, a cloud data center, not the same cloud data center. And then if you wanna share, like if your phone was gonna become your, app, your central application point, the latencies are actually a problem, not just in the wire to within these devices, but actually the cross latencies, these lateral communication moves is where, that's where I'm like, the, the thing that, that feels to me like it blocks edge is the fact that we have two things that are, that are laterally connected to each other but can't share data or can't connect into a aggregation point that's local with low latency. And so if you have, you know, these, these layered network, you know, if edge today looks like a whole bunch of layered stacks that can't talk to each other, even though they're next to each other, it strikes me as a huge innovation blocker. And, and what I would hope, I'll take it to this next step and see if this sparks some, some discussion. What I, what I keep hoping, and I, I think what the industry keeps hoping, is that the telcos are going to come in and drop infrastructure 
shared infrastructure at one hop away so that we can then build an application where we aggregate these layers together in a way that is, is cloud-like. Uh, I say cloud-like because it means that you have a, you know, near my, near my compute needs, I can actually go to an infrastructure, you know, go build shared infrastructure and apps. So, so and, I think the, the biggest yeah. problem for telcos to do anything is that they, for them, when they think about cloud, they think of like the lowest level of an IS, right? And if you really think about it, do I go to AWS because I can use an EC2 compute? Probably not, right? If I just need an EC2 compute, I might actually end up using something a lot more cost effective, right? So the whole notion of cloud is not understood clearly by the telcos. They think giving a VM or a container is going to solve the problem of the app developer, which it won't, right? So having, I mean, a shared uh, having a shared it's, layer, it's, it's have, layers it's layers of things right just if they could actually just give you a vm in in a data center in a pop and you had to spin up you know 10 v 10 vms to get to all the geos that would be a huge advance that somebody could afford i, I to, doubt it to do that. i actually i really doubt it that even if you gave that i don't think anybody would consume it because the problem is just serving VM, there's quite a few right i mean there's quite a few companies that will give you 50 milliseconds in different geographies, obviously, or 30 milliseconds, mm -hmm. but people don't consume it because they're not easy to consume. And what application will that solve, right? It's not clear to me. But inside the enterprise premise, there are use cases. But in those use cases, even if a telco shows up, the buying decision is made by a different team. The telco's relationship are with the, with the enterprise network guy, right? But the people that actually want to solve the edge problem inside the enterprise are the product teams, right? Or the business units. They never talk to the at and of the world. So I think there is an impedance mismatch when a telco shows up mm. in an enterprise, you know, with respect to who the buyer is. And this is exactly why companies like AWS actually are becoming the interface to network provisioning for a larger and larger number of folks. If you look at connecting services within AWS and you look at the, some of the services they offer like direct connect and other things, right? A, a lot of developers will tell you, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't want to think about the network, but they'll provision services knowing that Amazon will take care of the logic it takes to get them what they want. I would, I would expect that at the edge, one of, you know, one of two things would sell. W one thing that would sell was the telco saying, Hey, we, okay, we totally buy that Amazon, Google, and, uh, and uh, Microsoft are the three big clouds. We totally get it. We have an overlay service that you can get that just works seamlessly with their stuff, right? That would be one thing that might sell. And the other thing that's probably more likely to happen because of telco's history is that Amazon, Microsoft, and Google will increasingly offer services that take advantage of network provider pipelines underneath, uh, but don't really allow the telcos to differentiate at all, but allow the cloud provider to differentiate and basically say, you know, so edge is a perfect example. I can see AWS, set, you know, building their edge capability to the ability where they say for applications running in AWS, we can guarantee the following um, network latency times. We can f guarantee the following uh, ability to communicate between edge nodes without having to communicate, uh, you know, m more directly. Um, all those kinds of things uh, well before this problem gets solved, in my opinion, by any of the network providers, because Amazon will force the network providers to do their part in solving that overall problem from a service provider perspective. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, the best way to put telcos in this bracket is they need a vendor to do the work for them. And, uh, you know, uh, they need a Qualcomm or a Ericsson or Nokia to do the work and they all want press releases. But I think the mistake they're making with working with uh, the Azure's and AWS's and the others is not realizing that uh, they are essentially giving away uh, their, uh, their overall play, whatever they can control in uh, coming years, uh, at least from a revenue point of view. Because what will happen is as AWS and Azure's and uh, the others expand their businesses, whether it's edge or different services. And I agree with what Anko earlier said about uh, impedance mismatch because of product uh, and, the, and, the, and the buying decisions in different enterprises. 
uh, I think you, you clearly are going to see that uh, 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 the, the current cloud guys are going to take over large chunk of enterprise customers that uh, these telcos have, and they will, in my opinion, uh, would become, instead of being a 100% dump pipe that they were made in OTT era, they'll be about 70% dump pipe because they will save their skin at least 30% using network slicing and things like that. The last mile and the regulatory needs that a telco signs up for is going to keep them in the game uh, for for a long time. It's not going to go away, uh, just based on the experience and what I've seen uh, globally. Uh, I mean, if if you're doing an all IP thing, uh, a software platform or something, and providing a service through uh, a telco. Uh, you know, you need to have a Kalia built in for FBI and other things, et cetera. That's just part of their, uh, you know, license conditions. Uh, in AWS or GCP or Azure, doesn't have to do most of those things, right? So, so I think there are there are going to be some differences, but I agree, telcos are not going to innovate. Uh, the telcos in largely developed world are not going to innovate because they're sitting on a huge fat margin of hundred dollars a month per subscriber. Uh, and uh, they're not going to uh, rock the boat too much. But you got, you are going to see in China, uh, you're going to see in Korea, uh, India, Geo is already showing it. You're going to see uh, some operators, uh, telco operators, uh, innovating and uh, providing services uh, in, in coming years. Well, I, I, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, James. No, you go please. ahead, Joe. Yeah. Well, let's back up the bus a minute because not all telcos are created the same. You have regulatory considerations. Look at how the cable providers took away market share from the telcos because they did not have, they had, um, they had government relaxed regulation. They didn't even have to pay the same for the last mile. They got discounting on the last mile. You know, you've got all kinds of things that that's how the, that's how the, the broadband providers grew was they, they had, huge regulatory and pricing advantage due to that regulation. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if a, if one of the big three bought a telco. In fact, we've been having conversations internally about when that was going to happen, because I think it's going to happen. Mark, it you're always. It absolutely <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. It, yeah, no, it wouldn't surprise me either. I mean, I, I, um, the, the issue with the telcos though for purchasing would, I think it would have to be a very specific market opportunity. And, and when I think of those specific market opportunities, I think of countries that largely have um, monopoly owned or government owned um, telcos. And the reason why I think that's important is because that gives you um, an automatic dominance of them if you can buy it. Whereas if somebody were to buy Verizon, um, that would be important, but it would come with a significant amount of additional overhead that wouldn't necessarily, um, at least not automatically, help the cloud provider maintain or grow margins. Um, these guys yeah. have been doing fantastic jobs at, at building global networks, and most of them operate global networks that are bigger than the biggest telcos already anyway. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to me to see one happening, but it wouldn't surprise me just because, um, you know, the right place at the right time, anything's possible. Yeah. Oh, James, poor James, we have stepped on him twice. Sorry. No, all I was going to say is uh, I think they're interesting to pay attention to. But again, I just don't have faith that the telcos would know how to take advantage of it. But look at what Google's doing with Anthos and now with BigQuery Omni and doing overlay services that now are cloud services from a major cloud provider, but that run on other people's clouds as well, right? So you can imagine a network provider going out and saying, absolutely, we have a service that works perfectly with, um, with Amazon networking, works perfectly with you know, Microsoft networking, works perfectly with Google network services. Um, but it's a place where you can say, you know, very simply, hey, it's developer centric. So you can very simply say, hey, I need service A to talk to service B with the following properties assigned to it. And, uh, and we take care of the rest. And you know, something that's similar to this uh, but in a different space that I look at, and it's interesting, is what uh, is going on with uh, Derek Carlson and, and, and the Nats team at Sumedia. And the idea of having 
uh, building sort of a new interface to do a simple thing that we all just assume we know how to do right now, but making it easier to do. And that's, you know, with the events, instead of using a URL and an API to connect to something and say, hey, I want to subscribe to this, you have essentially, you go to one place and you say, I want to connect to this topic. And the infrastructure figures out where's the nearest node with the topic for me to send the events from. If you look at that as sort of, you know, kind of as a, an analogy or, or a parallel to what the network providers could do, um, you know, there's a powerful story there to say, what can you do to just make it dead simple to get incredibly advanced networking service? But it goes back to, um, and, and the, the last thing I'll say is it goes back to the margin comment that somebody made earlier, right? I think the problem at the telcos and the reason I have little faith is the same reason I have little faith that Cisco will do this, um, is because they're so margin driven that um that i don't think uh i don't think they're willing to to look at a business where they're going to make up that money in volume right so that's so that's the, the other problem the other problem that i've actually seen with uh, working with both telcos and the enterprise is that enterprise want a global service and telcos are regional right so if you really look at uh, only very few telcos like ntt have global data center footprint that they can say okay i have hundreds of data centers and I'll retool all of them, right? So that's the other problem. And they don't know how to federate. Uh, I mean, they've done it with roaming, but also that required a third party, right? So if you really look at it, the telcos are, aren't tooled, to, and that's why they lost to Twilio. If you look at the messaging war, I mean, that's something that's, I mean, it's incredible. The SMS market was taken over because the telcos couldn't provide a globally distributed service, right? Under one account, one API. So that is, I think, the other big challenge yeah. which AWS and Google and others don't have. It's, it's interesting because both of you are saying something that I, I interpret as the, the way this is going to get solved is by neither of those parties. It actually could be solved by a much narrower, because it's already verticalized and, and narrow inside the edges that we have today. All it might really take is a reasonable, you know, close proximity service. I mean, Ankur, you're building something like this already. I mean, so it, it maps to what you're, what you've been doing, which is if we had, you know, a, a cert, you know, easy to use service, service components that you could just say, oh, I'm going to drop a box into my office space, for my hospital, and, and it would create an edge aggregation hub, that, like a mini, I hate to say mini cloud, but cloud-like, but, you know, standalone then you, you could potentially end run all these problems. And it, it yeah, could be that that's the, I mean, hmm? You can get this today on our website, right? You just go sign up, it's free. So if you want two nodes, you can just get it for free. And it works across the cloud. And we have 23 data centers now globally uh, in the metro regions. Yeah, And I, all these edge nodes connect into those, those nearest POPs, right? And those POPs are connected using a globally symmetrical network. It's not a CDN network, which was built for downstream. It's built for symmetric upstream and downstream, right? And this is where I have the benefit of having uh, gotten an hour with James two days ago where, where I, he did an excellent podcast coming out on Lady Shiny. Um, so James, I, I'll yield to you, but the, he would, <laughs> my, my feeling is your, your answer is there needs to be a data, a da you know, a data path from that perspective, Ankur, it's it's I, I my feeling is that the the platforms that you're describing almost need to be drop in anywhere you want them, and then a shared data path. Um, yeah, I think, right. and I think I mean, the I, shared data path has to be service oriented rather than IP oriented, right? So the telcos don't understand the notion of service, yeah. right? And no, they say, no, oh, no. I have this. Well, yeah. I mean, I was just having this conversation today morning with the CTO of one of the largest telcos in the world. And he said, oh, I love your vote mesh thing and vote stack stuff, but I have a vote mesh, so can I do vote stack? And I think, no, you don't have vote mesh. You have an L3 VPN network. And that's, you know, it's an IP network. It's an IP transport layer. No, no developer builds stuff to an IP layer anymore, right? People use service addresses right. and they have like the DNS entries and they work at that layer, right? So. I think that that's the other problem that you really need a service oriented network that exists globally that shows up in the cloud or in shows up in the edge. And I think that's, that's another, and it's critical for, for security too, because if it's a service oriented network, 
you never expose uh, an IP connectivity, right? So it becomes a globally distributed proxy. And you know proxies are great because they are by definition more secure than, than an IP network, right? So let me ask you guys a question. Just bear with me a minute. The CDN guys, some of them reinvented themselves to do WAFs, right? And I was in a deal where, you know, I had two CDN guys at the table and two real WAF guys at the table and they were battling it out. So could the CDN guys reinvent themselves here again to service uh, they, this market? They are. They are. I mean, yeah, if you look are. at the Cloudflare, they've got Cloudflare workers. You got an API endpoint or like, actually they don't do API endpoints, but they do HTTP endpoints, right? So you have an HTTP endpoint, it creates, it triggers an event and that event is served by a worker, a JavaScript worker, for example, right? So they have already done that. In our network, you trigger it based on an API endpoint and you can plumb it into a Kubernetes uh, microservice, for example, right? Yeah, so but that's I already don't... happening. Okay, That's but I don't think it's wildly known, right? I don't think it's, I don't think that that's the, the business that they're getting right now. People are thinking about it. Would it work? I mean, what do you, what do you guys think? What do oh, you no, say? But I think Joe, this is Joe, one I'll of the problems. I'll give you some statistics, right? I'll give you statistics. I actually have real numbers on this one. So if you look at Stackpot, which is one of the, another uh, edge company, and if you look at Cloudflare, uh, both of them serve more than a billion requests per hour today. Those are served by workers. I'm not talking about the CDN. More than a billion API requests are served by their workers today. Right? So there are people who are using it. Obviously, they're coming from the CDN background, right? Even the buyer is the CDN buyer. He knows what to do. So he's doing transcoding or he's maybe doing some video overlay or something like that. Right? So those are very targeted use cases. They're not very generic or broad based use cases. It's not gone mainstream, as you said, but there is like, you know, within the CDN community, this is now more well understood or known. So, and, and I will say that one of the things I'm noticing a lot now that I'm sort of more in a company that, that sells a lot to infrastructure folks, VMware just disclosure, and, but also is now trying to have that developer conversation more directly. If you're focused on talking to infrastructure people, you won't hear it you won't hear what the developers are doing and how they're, how they're adjusting the way that they're doing the new services that they're consuming, the new infrastructure, the new technologies they're consuming. It's, it's absolutely, I mean, you hear about containers and you know about containers because containers are about capacity delivery. They're about delivering infrastructure ultimately. They're just about, you know, how do you provision CPU cycles using processes instead of using entire, you know, OS images. Um, but, um, but, it's it's really amazing to me that um, you know we still have these conversations about well uh, you know are, are is anybody using lambda is anybody using the CDN stuff is anybody and if you go talk to ve developers um, the truth of the matter is is that they've got a lot of legacy and in the enterprise they've got a lot of legacy they've got to work with so there's a lot of technologies that they use that we all know and love middleware everything else but for the new stuff that they're building they're very very excited about kind of moving away from having infrastructure conversations pretty much at all, right? We're having conversations that are simply about, hey, I have this code, I have this functionality, I want it to, this to connect to this with the following security applied to it or whatever. That's the conversation they wanna have and they're moving closer to that, but that's moving them away from an infrastructure conversation. That's moving them to a conversation with AWS, with Microsoft, with Google, with VMware to a certain extent, but you know, there's a few other companies kind of in, in that container, um, uh, management space that can that can play that game, uh, you know, Red Hat, for instance. Um, and so, um, it, but it's a narrower set of companies. And I think that's one of the things that's really interesting um, when you kind of go, is anybody using the CDN stuff, which is a great question, because I don't, I think, um, to the point that was made, I think it's a very narrow use case set that's using it. Yeah, but I that being said, you'd be surprised when you talk to developers, how many services there are out there gravitating towards and using that just bypass the conversation with the infrastructure side of IT entirely. Yeah, I think to answer Joe's question, I think a couple of things, like the one main thing is the feature proximity, I call it, right? I use economics terms a lot. So feature proximity actually is the, the fact that when you are procuring one uh, technology from one vendor and they ha happen to have the other thing also, 
right? So you will just buy stuff from there. So that's why we go to Walmart and Target, right? So uh, I think that plays a big role. And the second thing is uh, the data center availability all over the world, like how much they have. Actually, they do have enough, but they're they are also there's a perception that they are for just distribution of data not collection of data right so there are quite a few things like like i think f5 likes of f5 and they enable more caching and then data collection part through that caching and stuff like that so they brought kind of kind of compute to cdn in a way but um that journey is slow and then people don't buy from small shops Scale is a big thing. I, I, I feel like we keep coming back to impedance mismatch in the buying patterns as like, like that's the number one. Like at the end of the day, it, that's the thing that makes all this stuff not work. It's a, it's that. Um, uh, I mean that that's right. What Amazon solved in some ways, they just they figured out who the real buyer was and they reduced the. Well, they sold to all the people that nobody else was selling to all the guys in hoodies that were sitting in, you know, a dark room somewhere. I mean, let's and had a credit card to swipe. Come on. Right. But, but, you know, it, it is, yeah. it is when you look at, and Mark knows this better than anybody. When you look at IOT, you look at a really disparate group of buyers. We were talking with about to Keith about that the other day super disparate group of buyers. You can't just go, oh, I'll go call on the director of IT because that person isn't buying IoT stuff or edge stuff. Yeah, when you want to innovate, you want to go to non-consumers. When you want to topple the big guys, that's what Amazon did. They toppled the big guys. They were nothing. So they went to non-consumers. You're right, Joe. Jan, do, do you want to, you have a point? Oh. Like, no, no, actually, uh, they went to people who were not being served by anybody else, right? Uh, sorry, yeah. No, I've, uh, JMS oh, okay. or Andrea, yeah. okay, you're lowering it, okay. Yeah, no I, I, Just yeah, wanted... I think uh, response time and security and cost, all these three points are equally important, I think. And we are towards all these three cost effectiveness and response time. Some of the applications need really good response time and it needs infrastructure at the age. So a real time application needs response time is very important. So response time, cost and security of data. We are trying to solve this three effectively within the data. I think you need to be closer closer to your microphone or something. Having, I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry too. about yeah. it. Uh, I was talking about response time, actually. Response time and security and cost. These are the three things very important, actually. And who else was this three things will be in the better in, in the market. Yeah. That makes sense. Sorry if you can't hear me. <laughs> You're, yeah, you're quiet, so it's it's harder. <laughs> the um, I, so is there something that would break open? Like I keep looking for. I feel like Edge is this this thing that we all want to happen. I think we, if but, if we define it properly, then we can have better conversation. I think Edge is what's such a relative term. Uh, a data set, a, a closet. Mm -hmm in a departmental store is that edge i don't know i think it is but like you can may say that's a local data center right what are the regional data centers are those edge locations kind of right so where is that line between oh that i'm bank of america that's my data center i'm bank of america that's my edge in, in the branch. So there's no so such there's... thing as an edge data center. I guess, you know, this is something that Simon Crosby at swim.ai has, has talked about a few times, right? Which is like um, edge is in a place. Edge is sort of a, a, a architectural element of, of the way that your applications operate and function and how close you are. Um, you know, it, it, how, 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 
the yeah. role it plays in the overall flow of information and the processing of information um, from end to end, right? So to me, I have a problem when the conversation is, oh, you know, I'm going to use edge and I'm going to use it to connect things and I'm going to eliminate the cloud altogether, right? I, I get, that's when I get my hackles up because I'm like, to me, edge is, is legitimately a function, an architectural function, even a place, quote unquote, that lives between the end nodes and the central data center for the purpose of various scalability issues, very, uh, you know, timely processing, timely data um, routing, things, you know, all those kinds of things. So um, for me, that's, that's why, you know, I, I kind of go along that other thing like, you know, a sort of closet, heck, even a, um, even a MQTT broker device, Right or or a digital analog converter if it does more than just digital analog converting, which there there aren't very many that do that yet, but um, could be an edge device if it's consolidating flow in a certain way and providing certain kind of processing services in my mind. But that's pro I probably push it farther than most people because for me an edge is anything that's anything that's not an end node device and that's not in quote unquote in your core data center, your central data center, your central data processing, to me, feels like it fits that edge pattern. But that's just me. Yeah, it stays I, a relative I, term. I, mean, so. I, I agree with you that, you know, anything that's not sitting in your centralized cloud can be defined as an edge. Actually, even inside the centralized data centers, when stuff enters and exits the data center, people call it, that's my edge services, VPC, for example, right? So it's pretty common to, to bastardize the word edge because it can, you know, it can be, it's, it's like the old SDM, right? It meant everything to everybody, right? So well, and Rob, think, you remember these conversations around cloud just as well as I do and Mark, you remember months and months and even maybe even years of our time spent discussing what exactly is the cloud. And, and to me, it's kind of worthless to try to be too specific with it because it's a phenomenon and, and a systems phenomenon. Systems phenomenon define exact definition over and over again. That's, you're absolutely right, James. I mean, the, spot on. Yeah, but I think we can apply some of the, what, how cloud matured and we, how we came up with infrastructure as a service, platform as a service sure. and yeah, software as a service. True. So we can apply that's that true. to edge also. Like part of the edge is infrastructural. Part of the edge is, uh, uh, platforms, right? Gateways and stuff like that. Sure. And part of the edge is applications, right? So I think if we apply the same sort of principle there, it kind of starts to, things starts to fall in, in place a little bit more. So it was... So, um, so Rob, going back to your oh. original point, right? Where is, where are we with edge, which is actually doing better? Now, if you really look at it in the last two to three years, where more money has been made right. in the edge, is actually delivering a SaaS service than a PaaS or a IaaS service. What I mean by that is if you look at Samsara, right? Technically it's an edge company and they've done really well just because they've solved the business problem of the customer rather than saying, you know what, I'm gonna give you an infrastructure solution, go solve your application or, or uh, business problem yourself, right? So I think in some of these uh, complicated situations, or where you know the buyer himself is not very sophisticated, you are better off selling a software solution than a platform or an infrastructure solution, right? So I think that's where things have done well, and and I think that's how it's going to continue to do for for next two to three years till things go mainstream. I think that's an interesting, I, I, we're, we're reaching the top of the hour, so I, I, we're starting to lose people. And so, um, Ankar, I, I do not object to having you have the last word um, from that perspective. Um, and I would, I would invite people to, we're going to continue this conversation uh, on Tuesday at uh, 1 Central, 11 Pacific, as part of the weekly DevOps Lunch and Learn. And my goal in that conversation is to focus more on the ops side like talk about operating edge sites and, and be more targeted from that perspective. Um, so you're welcome to join. We'll have fun either way and the conversation will be recorded. So everybody, thank you for joining. Um, this was a great dynamic conversation. And if you like it, you know, just 
continue the conversation on Twitter and we can make this a regular thing. I don't have any objection mm -hmm. to spinning up a evening, evening chat um, for me evening chat. Good fun. Thanks for thank putting you. it up. Hey Rob, thank you for it. See you guys. Bye. Thank you guys. You're nice welcome. to meet you. Bye-bye. Always enjoy. Likewise, thank you. Bye.